Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you so much. It's great to see you all tonight. Thank you so much for coming out for this discussion. Tonight we are exploring the opportunities and risks around the use of AI algorithms to support or even make different types of business decisions. We have with us an amazing group of people and minds to address the topic, starting with Warren Barkley, GM of AWS Machine Learning Group, of course, Amazon Web Services, Paula Goldman, Chief Ethical and Humane Use Officer at Salesforce, Rachel Thomas, Founding Director of the USF Center for Applied Data Ethics and also co-founder of Fast AI, Jonathan Zunger, Distinguished Engineer and Chief Ethics Officer from Humu, and Kevin Collins, Managing Director, Software and Platform Services Accenture, is here to guide them in conversation. Bring you up in a moment, but welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, big thanks to Accenture, including Julie Rosendahl and Kevin Collins, for invaluable support and assistance in creating this occasion for all of us. They're continually looking around corners and through their periscopes, and we have a lot of really great conversations about what comes next, and so this is one example of that tonight. Uh, if this is your first time attending a Churchill Club program, I'm pleased to offer just a very brief introduction. We were founded in 1985, actually, um, kicking off with a program by Intel's Bob Noyce, very controversial at the time. The topic was offshoring. And today, we say that our mission is to strengthen innovation, economic growth, and social good. Uh, we, through programs such as we have tonight, which are topic-centric, we look for what's new, next, not widely known. So we try to pick up where conversations and information that's out there already leave off. And particularly under-discussed insights. So before we bring up our speakers, there is just one more thing to tell you, and that is that the hashtag is Churchill Club. <laughs> Let's bring our speakers in, up now, our panel up now. Thank you. Sorry, I went the wrong way. <laughs> the hardest part of the whole thing, right? It's just getting up here. That's the test, actually. <laughs> right? Failed. Okay. Thank you all for being here. I, I really do appreciate it. As Karen said, my name is Kevin Collins. Um, I'm <clears throat> part of our software and platforms industry team at Accenture, and I also run a thing called WebScale Services, which is a business we started a few years back that really seeks to take um, intelligent operations and um, figure out how to use that to transform things that we've done historically just with people. So as you can imagine, tonight's topic is something that's near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> Before we get started, let me just um, shower a little appreciation on, on Karen and the, and the Churchill Club team. Um, they, they do these things over and over and over again. They always come out great. Um, I can tell you, having looked behind the curtain a few times, that it is not easy. Um, even though it looks easy, it is not. Managing the venues and getting the word out and then managing the schedules, collective schedules of leaders like this is not easy. And this time, just because it was, why not, right? Let's add, it's the end of the summer vacation season <laughs> and Thursday before a three-day weekend and let, let's just see if we can do that. So, <clears throat> um, so thank you for that. And then thank you also to our panelists who um, took time out of their busy schedules to come and have a conversation that I think is just really important and one that we need to be having quite a bit. So to our topic, um, you know, for 100 years, we've been worried about the, the robot takeover, right? You can go back to the 1950s and see magazine covers about how factory automation is going to lead to the collapse of society. And, um, and it's been a big deal, and we've been talking about it for a long, long time. And as these systems have become more intelligent and more capable, um, those fears have only gone up. And it's not just anti-tech Luddites. It is some of our most tech-savvy, most you know, forward-thinking luminaries who are, who are raising concerns. So I think the, you know, the robot takeover is... Um, is an interesting conversation, but it's actually not tonight's conversation. We're not going to do that. <laughs> well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to plant a foot on either side of it. 
we're going to take one foot and we're going to plant it on the more practical side. And we're going to talk a little bit about a case that I think is a lot more prevalent, which is you working side by side with intelligent systems, with algorithms, you working in collaboration with them. And how does that work? And how do you manage it? And how do you structure it? In fact, the title of this program, Putting Algorithms in the Org Chart, came from a conversation that I had with a client who wanted to basically do a, like an audit of her, of her algorithms and quickly found out, I don't even know where they all are. Like, I don't even have an inventory, let alone an audit. And so as she started to think about this problem, these are, these are not just execution algorithms, these are decision-making algorithms. And I have these decision makers all over my company. The old days when I had decision makers that looked like us, right? Um, I had a whole system of checks and balances. I had a whole way of identifying if bad decisions were being made. And I had a way of training or coaching or putting governance around or in worst case, getting rid of bad decision makers, right? But algorithms are being deployed and a lot of that is not in, in place. So she said, you know, I think I need an org chart of my algorithms just to understand where they all are and what decisions they're making. So that's one foot. The other foot is more on the strategic and, and even the ethical side. And we're going to ask questions about as algorithms continue to proliferate through our companies and through our customers, what responsibilities does that bring to us? Right? Like, what do we have to do differently? How does my job change? Also, how do I think about what I'm responsible, what obligations I have to tell my customers about when they're engaging with, with these bots, right? How, how do I do that? So I hope we're going to dance back and forth between that very practical and very, I don't want to say theoretical, but for the very ethical side of the world over and over again. Format-wise, um, I'll ask half a dozen, nine questions. We'll kind of run through it. We will leave lots of time for your questions because as always in these sessions, there's some very smart people in the audience. There's a lot of really good questions out there and we want to make sure that, that you have a time to have time to get yours up there. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so, so for our topic, um, I, I don't really think we could have asked for a better group of people. You, Karen mentioned kind of who they are, what their titles are, but really interesting set of experiences, both practical and theoretical here, can really understand a lot of the problems that we're facing. So before we start with, with sets of questions, maybe we can just quickly go down the line and talk a little bit about, you know, how, how did you get here? What's your background in this space? And how do you think about, how do you think about our topic tonight? You want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, I was originally a musician, a uh, symphony musician. Uh, so that's how I got here. But, awesome. Uh, <laughs> so for intermission? Yeah. <laughs> uh, a long time ago. And uh, um, I started uh, in technology uh, many years ago, uh, worked at Microsoft, worked, did some startup stuff, uh, ran a public company. Um, and when it was about 2012, when I was uh, uh, running this company, I started getting interested in data science and AI in a kind of a serious way. And so I hired a research team of a bunch of PhDs, and that was kind of my side project, um, uh, experimenting with uh, a bunch of different models and things like that, algorithms. And that was kind of my introduction into data science. I went to Microsoft, worked in the AI team there, and now I work at Amazon. So. Um, and I think this, the topic's super important, and it's really super interesting that we're talking about this now. You know, in this arc of development, we're at the very beginning of it in many ways. Um, and so understanding, I, I think there's a real lack of understanding of, of what it is and what actually the problem set is and how do we address it as people. So, Thanks. Paula? Um, so I think my path is a little unusual. Uh, I'm an anthropologist by training. I, I got a PhD, I studied how, um, how unorthodox ideas become mainstream. So I'm fascinated about norms and how norms scale. And I'm also fascinated, have you know, basically spent my career in startups, nonprofit, for profit, sort of tech for social good, essentially. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, I was working for um, Piero Midier at the time, the guy that started eBay. And, uh, and we just had this moment, it's like, oh, tech for good's no longer enough. 
we need to like really be thinking about the consequences of tech at scale and started a tech ethics practice for him, then joined Salesforce to lead our work of embedding ethics into our tech. So I come to this conversation with that lens, right, which is saying we're in the midst of this massive transformation where we actually can't even begin to understand the consequences of the technology that is spreading in the world, but actually it's incumbent on us to imagine to the best of our capacity those consequences and try to get ahead of them. Hey, so my background, I have a PhD in math, um, and actually I found that to be a really toxic environment and ended up becoming a, <laughs> a software engineer and data scientist and found that to be a really toxic environment <laughs> um, and got, um, and I'd always kind of had an interest in, in social good and social justice, but got increasingly interested in kind of diversity and how these toxic environments uh, uh, were bad for that. Um, and three years ago, started Fast AI with the, the goal of making deep learning, making AI more accessible to a much broader group of people. Um, and I see that as kind of this, you know, <coughs> wanting people from more backgrounds to take advantage of the positives, but also to address the risk and harms we're seeing. And then became kind of increasingly drawn into those, those risks and harms. And then um, much more recently, just in the past few months, have launched the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so I started out as a theoretical physicist, and I also found it to be an incredibly toxic <laughs> environment. It's kind of a theme here. Um, and left that uh, to join what was then a small company called Google. Um, I spent uh, the next several years building up a lot of the very technical, like uh, the, the search mechanisms and the uh, storage and systems infrastructure. And in 2011, I uh, became a technical leader for Google's uh, social division which included a pretty wide range of products at the time, and quickly discovered that the kind of technical leadership they needed didn't have as much to do with uh, operating systems as with uh, problems of privacy, abuse, uh, policy, all these very complicated things that involved humans. And as a result, over the next couple of years, I basically morphed into Google's department of weird stuff, uh, dealing with all of the most terrifying and awful things involving humans. Um, and then two years ago, I. Uh, decided to, it was time to do something a little different. And so now I'm at uh, Humu, a small company started by Laszlo Bach, uh, where we are trying to make work better for people at scale and trying to continue that kind of, uh, this kind of work. So, so if you run across anyone who thinks that you just kind of start at the bottom of the ladder and you just climb the ladder like this, <laughs> <laughs> show them this video, <clears throat> right? Okay, um, so. Like I said, exactly an interesting, diverse set of opinions, hopefully non-toxic, for us to talk about, <laughs> how, um, about this issue. And, and I just want to start with sort of one of these Columbo-type questions, which is, like, kind of why now? Like, we've been, talking about, we've been talking about algorithms, and we've been talking about automation for a really long time. And so why is it important for us to have this conversation now as opposed to 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years from now? What is it about this moment that's changing that makes you think that, that now is the right time to, to talk about this? We should have probably had this conversation yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if you were playing <laughs> trombone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I think we should have, right? I mean, I, I mean some of the problems that we encounter that are around machine learning and AI are not unique to those uh, you know, areas, right? They, they just may accelerate certain parts of it, but I mean, some of the things around search and privacy and all the, the things that we had in the past have been there for at least 10 years. So I think that we're, uh, maybe we're at the point now where we're seeing data and compute and things like that with machine learning and the ability for it to do much more complex decision making and things like that. So people uh, become more worried about it, more heightened about yeah. the possibility um, of what it could be. Um, and so I think um, that awareness is just kind of triggered on in the last little bit. But so, so, so the problem has been there, but now people are just becoming more aware of it. That's yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, I would agree with that and just say I think it's happening at a larger scale now and that also <laughs> tech is exacerbating a lot of existing problems in society and really kind of leveraging those in a negative way to make them even worse at scale. Yeah, I, th I think I might even go farther and say that AI can often be a bit of a red herring in these conversations, yeah. that the problems we're discussing, we, act we, we should have been having this conversation 20 and 30 years ago too, yeah. because 
generally when you see a problem involving AI, you dig a bit deeper, it's actually a problem involving people and who put that AI there and why. <clears throat> and it, I think the good thing is it's pulling this up to the surface. But. So, so one of the arguments that you hear sometimes is, well, it's because the AI now is making decisions. Right? It's not just executing on what we tell it to do. It's now making decisions. Sounds like you don't buy that one. Yeah, so, so can you talk a little bit about that? Like, yeah, I hear that a lot. I was gonna say, you need to also, you, in a lot of these cases, people get kind of hyper-focused on the algorithm or on the AI, yeah. but you really need to think about the system that it's within and all the kind of human processes around it and the human yeah, institutions and existing processes that it's plugged into, because that's often where you kind of get these negative effects. And then also kind of even thinking just about the, the algorithm, there are so many human decisions that go into what data to use and how to frame the problem okay. and what to be doing. I also, th I also think if you take a huge step back, it's, it's we're, in this mo we're in this moment of huge societal anxiety, right? Yeah. And people are, you know, at the heart of some of the so-called tech clashes, questions about like, have algorithms affected our elections? Questions like that, right? And so who's making those decisions and why? Th that's, it's those types of broader context that's then trickling down to you these types of business decision questions that are now in the in the crosshairs so that leads to so let me let me ask this question do you think there's a is there a way to categorize is there a way to set a set of criteria that says you know what in these cases we shouldn't use algorithms at all is that a fair thing to say we're going to quarantine these kinds of decisions and we're only gonna use them over here where it's okay. I don't think that's quite the right way to split it. Um, like what, what I'd say is, okay, where, where am I to use an algorithm? If you have a manual process that you've started to understand and has started to become repeatable, that's a perfect place to start to automate it with an algorithm. Okay. Um, and that includes decision-making, right? Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of very repa repetitive parts of decision-making involving doing the research and things like that. And you just have to have some common sense. So for example, you have an AI that maybe helps you do the research for it, gives you even a preliminary decision, and then you sanity check it. And that's not because it's a fundamentally dangerous thing necessarily. It might just be because why on earth would you trust this thing? I mean, it doesn't necessarily know what it's doing. <laughs> but on the other hand, you don't necessarily know what you're doing either. And I think we really overestimate the quality of natural intelligence a lot. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and so I think really the cases where you can use AI meaningfully is you have the cases where you're automating manual processes, in which case it really, it integrates into a system just like you would integrate any other room full of well-intentioned idiots into a system. And the other case is the case where to a certain extent it doesn't matter, where it's going to make mistakes and you think about what, what is the cost of different kinds of error and you've decided, well, even with the worst errors it makes, that's totally okay. So let's ship this thing and do something that maybe you wouldn't even be able to do without the humans because you've decided the errors are acceptable things. I mean, if you put an algorithm in charge of your core business decisions, you're, you deserve what you're about to get. So, so then it's a risk analysis. It's a matter of, is the decision too big for an algorithm? I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say it's too big. It's more like, I mean, these things are conceived by people and run by people and, you know, under, you know, understood in most cases by people. Um, and I think that it's, it's a question of, uh, you know, are you putting the right framework around it to, to know what comes out is, you know, what's expected or not expected the, that you're actually um, testing these things, right? Like, what are the limits? What are the counterfactuals? Do you understand what you've actually built? Um, and, uh, and there are ways to do that and ways to put frameworks around it. I don't think it's a, a question of where where to use it and what to use it for, but you got to understand that you know we're valuable as people. Uh, these algorithms are just a reflection of us, right? And I would just add to that that the systems really need to consider mistakes and have a recourse for mistakes and think how you're going to minimize the damage from mistakes and catch them quickly, but not to assume that there won't be mistakes. Um, I feel like it's where you get kind of the worst outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that's the interesting thing, right? When, when people make decisions, we make mistakes all the time, but we have this whole system around us to catch and, and, and provide governance or provide, well, sure, you can, you can point to examples where it failed, but it, it works a lot. <laughs> it, well, it also fails a lot. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, but the question is, should we put these kind of systems around the algorithms? Because I, what I don't see is that being done consistently. 
this is another place where I think the algorithm is a red herring. It's a, when people aren't putting systems around the algorithm, they are being lazy about something. And often when they're being lazy about something, you know, every decision is actually the application of a value. And if they've decided to be lazy about this, that tells you about what they actually value. Mm. Um, the, yeah, the, I mean, one of the interesting documents that I came across lately was uh, from the Federal Reserve, believe it or not, um, the Currency <laughs> Control Office. Um, and, you know, like the FinServ folks are really worried about explainability and understanding how they got from here to there and stuff. But th they have a document about, you know, how do you manage models and how do you actually govern them and things like that. And it, I would suggest going and looking at that because it's got great ideas about how are you testing them, you know, how are you boxing them. One of the interesting pieces that, you know, we do quite a bit was is that we have uh, this uh, concept called Bar Razor. Um, and we use it for both uh, interviewing and all sorts of things, but technical design, model building, and stuff like that as well. Whereas we have someone who's not in our line of business who comes in and then basically uh, you know, validates and peppers the designers and builders of that model and says, you know, does this make sense? Is this the right thing to do? Um, is this the right design? You know, where's your data coming from? How do you do this? And that person, a very independent person coming in and kind of being able to kind of look at your stuff and give you another perspective on it. I think you have to do things like that if you want to have great validation. And that's, in fact, in that document that I just talked about, they actually suggest that. Yeah. To riff a bit on something Rachel was saying, which I thought was really important about errors and mistakes, um, you know, engineering as a whole breaks into two major subjects. Product engineering is about how systems will work. And safety engineering is about how systems will fail. Mm. And it. In mature disciplines, like if you look at civil engineering, for example, there's not really a very big distinction between them. You know, I mean, I one of my childhood friends, he's a civil engineer. I would say he probably spends more time thinking about how the system could fail, like what is its stress, what happens if everything breaks. That's not his job. He's, his job is in safety engineer. He builds roads. Um, on the other hand, you go into CS and you see a fleet of young product managers, freshly graduated from college, ready to change the world and disrupt something. I mean, I, I once heard someone with a straight face talking about disrupting retirement planning. I'm thinking, like, have you ever walked up to someone and said, I'm going to disrupt your retirement planning and had them think that was a good thing? Um, it, it, but in... I think what we need to do is we need to consider safety engineering as a first class thing. And mm -hmm. yeah. when, especially when we are building these systems, it's, in fact, in the high impact system here, it's not that because there's an algorithm, but because uh, I'd say the, the thing that really causes qualitative change is when something qualitatively changes the cost of something, right? Of communication, of advertising, of transport, or something like that. When you're going to do something high impact, or even if you're going to do something that you think is low impact, you have to be thinking through the failure cases, thinking through the errors, and understanding how bad can things go. Because generally, how good things can go is bounded above. How bad things can go is not <laughs> bounded below. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. There's an issue with a lot of tech companies are set up where product and engineering are kind of completely separate from trust and safety. But trust and safety absolutely should be kind of like informing the product decisions or, you know, even uh, in the same team. And I would just add kind of two groups to really that need to be kept closely involved are domain experts and then also the people that will be impacted by dis uh, you know, by whatever the algorithm is. And it's really, I think, important to have representatives from both of those groups um, working closely on um, kind of what the algorithm is and foreseeing the impacts. Yes. This is, I'm so, I want to like bring you guys into Salesforce. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was exactly, so you're talking about exactly what my role is at Salesforce. And I, and I honestly think we're at a moment um, with these types of processes that we were in as an industry with security. 15, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Where yeah. it's like security is a cost center. How could you possibly predict the way all the people would hack your system? And now you would not ship a major product without red teaming, right? For all these different vulnerabilities. Yeah. And I think we're, we're similarly there. And I think this gets to your question. So we're in the early days of thinking about what are the consequences of these algorithms in the world and building systems both S systems and processes that go into like the product roadmap, um, as well as kind of broader governance systems. And it's like day one. And we're kind of like taking metaphors from security and accessibility and other different places, and then making it up, trying to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Every day is day one. 
my company. Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it cost me, cost me five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say there are academic fields like uh, science, technology, and society yeah, (SDS) absolutely. that have been studying this, but have often kind of not been included or incorporated into to tech Super companies. Super important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, think I completely agree. Yeah. Um, so a very good friend and collaborator of mine, Leah Kistner. Uh, she, uh, she was a head of uh, uh, technical privacy for Google, and now she's chief privacy at Humu. Um, she developed sort of what we might call like the modern product privacy approach, where instead of having the privacy team be this compliance-oriented team that's coming in reviewing things, instead it has people who deeply understand privacy and respect for people, but also deeply understand products and embeds them in every one of these teams from day one, so they're helping them with the actual the entire process of design as well as training up the team members, because you can't retrofit this stuff. I mean, I've had so many teams come to me for privacy reviews who didn't think about it and thought, oh, we'll just get this checked off two weeks before we launch, um, which turned into six months before they launched because, and or several years before they launched because they had to throw everything out and redesign it. Um, it you can't hack this onto the side, and people keep trying to do that. And, yeah. So, so, so far, we've been talking a lot about kind of within a company. Mm -hmm. Right. Let, let's let's just broaden that for a minute and talk about how, how what are what happens now as we start to provide algorithms outside the walls of my company. Right. And so, I think two questions immediately come to mind. The first one is, I now don't have control about how that's being used. Right. I provide an algorithm to a, a customer. That customer goes and does what they do. How do I how do I police that if if that's the probably the wrong word, yeah. but how do I stay on top of that? How do I understand what's happening? How do I set some guidelines around that? And then, and then how do you think about responsibility and recourse, I guess, around those kinds of questions once you release it into the, into the ether? I, I can speak to that, at least the first part of that question, because it's a large part of my job, right? It, so if you, you can look online right now at our um, Salesforce is acceptable use policy. And there's a few clauses about the use of our AI products. And one of them says, for example, if you're using these products to make decisions about things of legal significance, like, uh, or the equivalent, who might get a loan, you know, who might get a job, uh, you need to have a human make that final decision, right? So there's a distinction, get to one of your earlier questions about which of these types of decision-making processes might be most risky, and we really need to be aware of it, you know? Um, there's also restrictions, like there's one in there that says if you're using a bot, you need to tell people you're using a bot, right? Um, so the, I think there's, there's a handful of things that you can write into policy, and there's a lot of education work that's deeply needed because uh, not many people besides me read acceptable use policies. And, um, and also, because, because frankly, when people are just getting started, don't know how to use these technologies, don't understand you know, the, the downsides and the possible risks, and like, you know, so I think that's one, one possible mechanism. Just, I, just on that point, yeah. is, that, is that common? Is, is everyone telling people when they're using a bot? Telling people when they're using a bot, or telling people when they're interacting with an algorithm. No, that's not I don't common. think that's what I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious. I just, it's an interesting question, right? Is what responsibility do we have to disclose? You know, again, again, I think it's, we should go back to the question of the of the system, not the component, right? The, the fact that you're talking Fair. with a bot is rarely the important aspect of the question. Um, I, I'm actually I'm a little curious about what you meant in the in the question because it's, I think there's sort of a spectrum of ways this could be applied. You know, so you have a, what uh, Paula was just discussing, which is very similar to what I do in my own work, where as a company you know, we are providing a service using AI to provide information which a customer could horribly misuse, and we have to warn them very carefully. And you know, in our case, we work very closely with customers to make sure they never try to use this information in the wrong way because it would in fact have the opposite of the intended effect. Okay. Um, but then you can start to move to the spectrum where, okay, then you have companies that are providing tools that will do decision making for a customer. Mm -hmm. And these can go very, very wrong. Uh, there's a, a case called Compass, which I think is sort of the infamous, uh, really bad failure of that, which I'm sure we can talk about. Um, and then you go all the way out to situations like AWS or you know, and Google or places like that, where you're actually providing AI as a tool to people. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is a dual use sort of tool. It, 
can and absolutely will be used for malicious purposes as well, or, uh, or for that matter, providing lots of data the way Facebook did through their uh, lovely social graph API, which couldn't possibly have gone wrong. <laughs> Um, and so I think there's, there's actually very different questions we're asking, and so I'm wondering where. Hmm. So, so please. Yeah, no, I mean I think that the I mean I think that the there's a lack of understanding. I, I mean one of the things that when you talk to business people, <coughs> they don't understand that <coughs> technology was largely deterministic. It, AI and ML is largely probabilistic. That is actually a big difference, right? People understand that. I mean. Uh, Rachel's uh, Fast AI site has some really great training on AI. Um, people got to get educated on this. And in general, I think business decision makers don't know, don't understand it. And I think that technologists don't know, don't understand it. Um, and I think that that's a, a big piece. Uh, we often get asked uh, to come in and do talks, you know, to engineers and stuff at, at different companies. But the reality is, is that if you don't have like an active education process in your technology group at whatever the company is about what is ML and AI, then um, you know, there's going to be much bigger mistakes made and it's going to be much harder for people to understand what's going on. I think there also needs to be more of kind of thinking about how humans and computers work together and how to best leverage the strengths of both. Because um, I think a situation you see a lot is where someone has basically tried to totally automate what a human does, but of course can't quite automate that. And so then they put a human back in the loop, but in some weird suboptimal way, you know, for instance, either something where the algorithm's, you know, maybe right 95% of the time and you're expecting a human to catch the other 5%, even though we know that's what humans are horrible at, of, you know, uh, <laughs> catching something that mostly works. Um, or maybe the human is going to be held responsible if there's a failure, but they don't actually have the autonomy or power to uh, meaningfully intervene. Um, and so I think that those situations kind of often arise, though, out of this, you know, like, oh, let's just try to automate exactly what a person's doing. Oh, okay, we can't really do that. Let's mesh these things together, as opposed to thoughtfully thinking, like, how could we leverage computers and humans? Well, but Rachel, can I, get, can I invert that? So mm -hmm. can we imagine a better version of that. So instead of the algorithm does it 95% of the time and then you're the fact checker for the five, can you, can you describe a scenario where it's merged together well, where the human and the AI are, are set up appropriately? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, no, I think this, that is a much harder task to, to describe what it, what it looks like working well. well yeah, I mean, I can give you a scenario, like uh, legal documents. Anybody in here done diligence? What a painful process. Mm -hmm. um, someone uploads 50,000 contracts to a, a data site. Uh, you now have to have how many hundred paralegals go through that contracts and find out what the limits of liability are. Um, that's a perfect situation where you can use machine learning and comprehension to semantically understand which of those documents actually have terms and conditions that you need to actually review, uh, you don't need to look at every document and you don't look at every page. Right. Uh, it's a perfect thing for a lawyer. Now they're looking at, what, a thousand documents. I'd still want to shoot myself. But um, <laughs> it's not 50,000 documents. It's faster. It's whatever. The machine's really good at seeing those things. Um, and the human's really good at making judgment calls about, is this really uh, impactful on this acquisition or not? That's a, that's a perfect example of where those things can work together. Actually, another example is um, from the Fast AI library. Um, so there's like a key parameter you have to set, the learning rate. And basically, we run a process and then surface a graph that a human can kind of very easily interpret, because humans are good at kind of taking in visual information and picture form and f find meaning <coughs> from. And this is something that a lot of people have asked us, like, oh, can't you completely automate it, though, and just have it like spit out a number at the end? Like, why do I have to spend two seconds looking at this graph? Um, and kind of not really Realizing there's like a lot of valuable information in the graph that you would lose if you tried to automate that last um, hmm. last one percent of the process. Yeah. So uh, why? No, please. Go oh, I was going to say another really obvious example of uh, search. Uh, it's a classic augmentative AI technology, right? I mean, this like we don't often think of it as an AI problem, but it's the you utter a noun phrase, this thing has to understand what you meant by it, look at about a trillion documents, understand what they mean, understand how trustworthy they are, and match them together. And what's its purpose? It doesn't make a decision for you, but it surfaces what might be relevant to you and acts as a prosthesis for the fact that you know the, this horrible flaw we have that our memory and our knowledge isn't infinite. Mm -hmm. um, 
But again, it's, it, these are devices specifically structured and built for the purpose of augmenting a capability rather than supplementing, than uh, replacing it. So, so why aren't we doing that more consistently across all of our problem statements? How can we have all these other cases where we're merging them together poorly? Is it an org situation where I don't have the right teams working together? Is it a governance? Is it a strategic problem? How, how do we do it better? How do we fix that? Okay, so let me go back to the Compass case, I think, for an example of like wh why this goes horribly. So for, for those who haven't heard about this, Compass is a company that uh, provided these wonderful AI tools to help judges make sentencing decisions. And uh, as, was, as came out in the expose back in 2016, um, so you know, they, they were very systematic. They did, wanted to make sure they didn't have racial bias, so they didn't take race in as a parameter. Um, of course, they did take people's address, name, and income, which especially if you're in, say, Broward County, Florida, is a really, really good proxy for race. And the slight problem is, of course, it, it wanted to predict recidivism. And the slight problem is that lights don't go off over people's heads when they commit crimes. Um, so they used as a proxy arrests. Because, and so what they actually did, they, they, they claimed they were predicting, um, is this person likely to commit a crime again? And what they were actually predicting is, who is the person most likely to be arrested for a crime? And mm. the answer to that one is, of course, the black one, because, um, you know, US. Um, <laughs> and this thing just ran roughshod over people's lives in huge volume. And even after the expose, I don't think they actually changed their practices in any horrible way. The Wisconsin way. Supreme Court upheld the use of this yeah. software, yeah. And so the thing is, this is, I mean, this is just egregious in all sorts of ways, but. The decision, and so what happened here, this was advisory for judges, but quickly became essentially the thing making the decisions in practice. And people were really happy to delegate making this hard decision that they didn't want to make to a system where they knew it was probably actually doing something wrong, but they were actually okay with it doing something wrong because it was you know, penalizing black people more heavily and it wasn't penalizing them more heavily because, yeah, again, we're in the US and it, basically surface that they were fine with it. People's values manifest in the decisions they make, and if they're using AI in a crappy fashion, that tells you about what's actually important to them at the end of the day. Yeah, and I'll just add um, uh, one point to that. There was a study from Dartmouth that found that this algorithm was no more accurate than Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, which are just random people on the internet uh, performing the task. So it wasn't even a very, very good algorithm at all. Um, and I think that some of what you have there is also just kind of this misalignment of incentives and values. Um, I mean, this kind of private company is earning money off of this proprietary software that isn't very good. It's something that the public does not have much um, insight into. Often in court, uh, such software is protected as you know proprietary trade secrets, so it's very hard for people to appeal or challenge its use. Um, and I think that often the people kind of making, actually this is, a, sorry, an example I think that gets it, this is kind of an existing problem uh, in the US of kind of shady contractors getting uh, lucrative government contracts that, and, and then not delivering well. And so in a way, this is just kind of like adding AI to that problem. Um, and I think sometimes kind of also dazzling the people that you're selling to who may not be um, kind of have the, the, the data literacy to um, evaluate the claims that the company is making about this product they're selling. Uh, and that, I think th this, is obvious, that this is like the textbook. This will yes. be in the textbooks. When yes, the textbook, yes, if textbooks is, yeah. still exist. When <laughs> this feel, anyway, um, but, but I think what you're getting at is kind of the core, the essence of the problem, right, which is... Um, and the essence of the anxiety that some feel, um, that is to say, if a person's making the decision, there is a sense, rightly or wrongly, that you can hold that person accountable. And there is a sense, if it's an algorithm making the decision, that we don't have the tools to hold the algorithm accountable. And that's, why, that's the moment we're in. That's why, we're, why it's such a critical business issue if you're using algorithms across a variety of functions in the business and why it's such a critical societal issue. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, people use bureaucracy exactly the same way. Well, but yeah, so Dana Boyd makes this point that um, kind of throughout history, bureaucracy has been used to evade responsibility. And today, algorithmic systems are basically extending bureaucracy. And so just making it even easier to evade responsibility with kind of one more place to point fingers. So uh, are you aware of anyone who's doing a good job of addressing that problem? So if, if there's an algorithm and it makes a bad decision, you're not going to send the algorithm to jail 
Like what, what, what are we going to do? Do we provide recourse to an engineer? Do we provide recourse to a company? Is there a, is there a government entity? Like how, how do we think about who's responsible for that decision? Is anyone, anyone tackling that one? I mean, lots of people are tackling this one. And it, it, I mean- Anyone doing it well? Re recourse is a question of systems, right? Mm -hmm. And with every system, there's a trade-off. So okay, here's a classic example of the hard trade-offs. Um, people have two huge complaints about abuse policies on social media. One of them is they keep failing to take things down quickly, even as like new threats emerge and they don't like respond quickly enough. And the other one is their policies are opaque and there's no system of like recourse and precedent. So basically, you're saying that they need to be more closed, more fast executing and be able to shift really rapidly, but also have completely open processes with case law and like judicial redress. Right, and we're also making up the, the standards as we go. Right, yeah. it, and, and I think the real answer is we are making this up as we go and we have to develop systems of recourse as we go. But I mean, it, that's not that it's fundamentally impossible to have a recourse any more than it is in a bureaucracy, right? It's just, we have to think, we have to design systems, and I mean systems including people that are appropriate to the individual cases. Another case I would say is, um, uh, ProPublica discovered that on Facebook, you could place an ad for an apartment and say, I don't want black or Latino people to see this ad, um, which seems like a violation of the Fair Housing Act from the civil rights movement. And this is something the original article came out. Facebook was like, oh, we're so sorry. Over a year later, ProPublica repeated the study, and it was still the case that you could do this. Um, and then just this spring, I think that um, HUD did bring a suit against Facebook. And I mean, you can argue about the particulars of whether you know it was... Um, uh, severe enough to actually, uh, it was, wasn't for, you know, Facebook to, to really uh, suffer any penalty for kind of repeatedly doing this. But that is an example where I think it's kind of seems like, okay, well, like we had the mechanism in place, it just wasn't functioning properly. Yeah, I guess it, it's a bit similar to this question that, you know, and not really our subject tonight, but of um, AI controlled weaponry. You know, people say, like, oh my God, how will you deal with this and so on? You know, with a bow and arrow, once I fire it, the arrow is flying on its own and might hit someone. We never think about blaming the arrow for hitting someone because that would be stupid. Um, if you are deploying a, some kind of sophisticated artificially intelligent weapon and it starts killing people, you were the one who was deploying it. Um, and so I mean, to some extent you can say there, there is still a single neck you can throttle. But also um, the, these questions of accountability, even when we say, I mean, there's actually, there's two questions that I think we're slightly conflating here. There's recourse to fix the problem, and there is, is there someone who should be punished? Mm. And if you're asking that second question, sure. you really need to go into the question of what exactly are you trying to achieve by punishment? Uh, because already, I mean, if you think about the concept of, uh, you know, the legal concept of corporate personhood, there's already tremendous shields to make sure nobody gets punished for the most egregious things in our society. So, yeah. <laughs> It's not an isolated issue. Yeah, yeah, no, that's actually a really interesting point because we, we do think yeah, when, when a decision, when a bad decision gets made and someone who should have gotten an opportunity to get hired doesn't get hired or somebody who should have gotten a house doesn't get a house, like there is that desire for something needs to be done. There needs to be a punishment behind that. So there's the, how do I fix it? How do I prevent it? How do I you know, remediate? And then there's also, should there be a punishment there? So I, I think it's fair to, to split those apart, good, good point. So if we split those apart, I think the remediation angle is probably pretty clear, right? Like we, we kind of know what we have to do. Yeah. It's hard, but it's, it's sometimes hard, but it's clear. The question becomes who's responsible? Like that's a, that to me is a really hard one. Who's responsible in the sense of punishment, you mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that it's different than it has been in the respect that these systems are run by people. Yeah. To and, the person, right? Whoever's, there's okay. there's people that that run and build and and uh, you know design these things. Uh, now, whether it's a corporate whatever or something like that, but ultimately, some there's a human in the loop to, for the lack of a better word, um, in this thing. And how are you know are, the, are those people? And I think this is part of this education process. Is that you know yeah you can use bureaucracy as a point at that, you can use the system and point it at that, but the reality is it's, it's, all, it's about people, right? We have to hold the people accountable who are actually uh, building and running these things. So. 
Which, I mean, Jonathan brings up the great point that that's not something we're great at doing. <laughs> <laughs> as, as an understatement, we are we're terrible at doing that in general, because I think a lot of also, to me, what feels upsetting about these uh, high-profile terrible cases is not just that they happen, but that people are earning a lot of money off of it, that these companies are very profitable. Um, another classic, uh, not classic, but case was um, software that was implemented to determine Medicaid benefits that had a bug that um, wrongly cut the um, hours of aid that people with cerebral palsy received. And so you had people that really needed um, home health aids uh, that had their hours cut drastically. There was no recourse. They couldn't get an explanation. And that's something where uh, this is a very profitable business. The software is used, I think, in over half of the 50 states. And I think that feels particularly egregious of like these people are continuing to profit off of this. Yeah. Yeah. I Maybe to play devil's advocate here for a little for a moment, which is a little bit weird coming from a chief ethical and human use officer, but um, <laughs> but I, but I think these are like huge and urgent problems. But we should also not lose sight of the fact that there are places where we've got you know algorithms working totally fine, and there are systems that kind of you know govern them, or they're transparent enough that people you know don't raise an eyebrow. So I was just thinking about you know, the, the original core product of Salesforce, or our sales cloud service, right, where the whole idea, the whole value out of that is salespeople are entering their data into that system, and there's an algorithm that's judging their success, and they know exactly what the ratio is that they're being measured at. And people, you know, and they ask for that, right? And so, so I think there are ways, and, and that's obviously a much simpler example than, you know, some of the more advanced technologies that we're talking about. Uh, and so I don't want to, you know, when you start talking about black box algorithms, and it's a whole different conversation. But, but I also don't want to. I also don't want to leave people with the impression that like this is this huge unsolvable problem because yeah. I don't. I don't think it is. Well, you, one of the things you brought up just twice right there was sort of the old sunlight is the best disinfectant argument. So are we just not doing a good enough job yet of? explainability. I, I think there, there's an issue with uh, metrics can and will be gamed. And so sometimes there's a tension between kind of how much you reveal about your metrics and how much they're being gamed. And this is actually not distinct to technology either. An example from the UK, uh, they passed a law saying that uh, the success rates for surgeons would be published. And so heart surgeons began turning down high risk but necessary surgeries because they didn't want their rate dinged. And you have people that, you know, need, need surgery. And and so I think uh, a lot of kind of, or there are many harmful effects that we see with tech that are kind of a result of these like uh, metrics gone wild or, you know, putting too much, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> too much uh, <laughs> stock in any one metric. Yeah, I mean, well, I think explainability is a huge thing, right? I mean, we're still very early in the tool sets that uh, allow you to understand the entire flow and you know, there's very few people on Earth who can correlate 100 million pieces of data and understand what happens <laughs> at the bottom of it. I'm not one of them. Um, but, uh, I mean, those tool sets of being able to visualize, uh, be able to test the systems, to be able to understand, you know, those are you know, just being built right now. I mean, yeah. There's very few out there. And I think that that's a huge area of research. You know, there's um, several interesting research projects going on right now to be able to do that. But uh, I, I think that that's an area that... Uh, you know, I think that we need to put a little more energy in. Actually, and funnily enough, the, one of the leaders in this is DARPA. So uh, they have some of the very impressive uh, research projects around this. Well, I feel like I'd, I'd also hesitate about, I mean, I, I think on the one hand, explainability is incre incredibly valuable, incredibly important, really a thing we need to be pushing. But we also shouldn't consider it as a panacea. No. And that's both, I think, sort of two reasons. Like One, because you know, p people are actually incredibly bad at explaining their own decision-making process, but think they're incredibly good at it. Mm -hmm. And yet, like, what, what was that old paper? Like, it turns out if you have someone hold either a cup of hot coffee or of ice water and then like meet someone, uh, that person's perspective of their warmth and empathy will change <laughs> radically. And it turns out it's actually because of the temperature of your hand. Um, so first of all, people are actually very bad at explainability. And the other one is sunlight is not necessarily a good disinfectant. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you've ever read *A Transmetropolitan* uh, by Warren Ellis, um, you know, in the in the in the 90s when it was written, it was this piece of dystopian science fiction about incredibly corrupt uh, politics, where ultimately journalism saves the day. It's this amazing love song to journalism, and it's really depressing to read it nowadays because, first of all, almost all of the science fiction just feels like the news, and second, 
you know, at the end when, like the journalist, I, I'm sorry, I might spoil a bit of this, but when the journalist reveals the horrible thing that the politician had done, and it really it, it can torpedo this politician's career, instead, nowadays, the politician would just go up there, make it part of his stump speech, and brag about it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, go, going on that, there was a study of uh, financial advisors that when they disclosed their conflict of interest, that actually made people more likely to trust them. Um, as an example of, yeah, sunlight not, not necessarily working because people were like, oh, they're being forthcoming that they have a conflict of interest yeah. and then made the, you know, the bad investment anyway. Um, and I, yeah, I totally agree with that, a point about, I think explainability is sometimes... Um, overemphasized or misleading just because humans are bad at explaining our decisions and I think being human is kind of being about being a master of post hoc justifications like this is what we we evolved to do and there's a risk with that for algorithms as well there was an interesting paper on I think they called it fair washing uh, but you could give a fairness criteria and it was possible basically to back engineer a fairer algorithm than the one that actually came to the decision but that would come to the same decisions um, as you had originally, oh. yeah, originally found, which is a, a real concern of, you know, and something to keep in mind uh, when, when considering algorithms. Huh. So I, I want to make sure we have some time for, for this group to ask some questions, but can you, um, can, can we project forward a little bit? Can we, um, let, let's just think about uh, these things are only going to get more sophisticated. They're only going to get more prevalent. They're only going to get further into your companies and outside your companies. What do, what do we do? So, so, so now you're king for a day, queen for a day. You, you, you're going to wave the magic wand and say, here's where we should focus in order to mitigate some of the disaster scenarios that you've talked about and to emphasize some of the positives that you've talked about. So where do you focus? My wife says I'm kind of a princess, so I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> But, uh, I really um, no, I mean, I, I, this uh, to me comes back to education, right? People are, uh, you know, do you understand what you're doing and do you understand well enough? Um, you know, we, we try to make things easier for folks to do, but you have to have some sort of basis of understanding of what, what these systems are and how they work. And um, that's, I think, you know, if we look at the future and things like that, that learning curve is steep, but people need to crawl up it, and if you don't, uh, you're not, you don't really have the ability to even police yourself around when you're building this stuff. This is a broad-based education across people who, so far, we've just been taking these things from the experts, yeah. and now it's, everyone's got to get smarter. Yeah. Okay. I do have that magic wand within my company. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, so just ask me tomorrow. I'll figure it out. Thanks. No, but but really, that is my role, right? And so and so um, the the things that we're focusing on are, are sort of building the capacity for predictive imagination and for uh, the same types of risk schema that you might use for, say, security, for specific types of ethical issues that we might face and building that into our, you know, our, our roadmaps and building that into kind of the, the muscle that all of our employees uh, act with. And that's, you know, and build, you know, and, and, and thank you for the correction earlier. This is not day one. People have been thinking about these problems for a long time. How you tra translating that into practice uh, is, is a major challenge and it's super exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. I would um, just make a shout out to the Marcula Center, which is an yeah. ethics center at Santa Clara University, and they have a tech ethics toolkit. This is for free on their website, and this is a group of ethicists that have developed this, and it has kind of a number of practices you can incorporate into your processes, which I think is necessary. Um, and so I know a key one of them is like ethical risk sweeping, which I think is similar to kind of what Paula was suggesting about this red teaming and really proactively trying to look for risk before they happen. Yeah. And I think uh, I, I, I think uh, there's sort of two things that we really need like going forward. One of them is exactly what we're talking about here, this ethics that to basically build into the discipline of software engineering the same understanding of ethics, of risk, of safety, and so on that other branches of engineering learned 100 years ago. The other side, I think, goes to what we were talking about earlier about accountability and responsibility. Um, we've done a really good job as a society of not having that at very large scales, and, this, and AI is just the latest thing making it visible, but I think that the deeper thing making it visible here isn't AI, it's uh, the, there are the technological changes which are 
like really like shifting people's daily lives. There are the environmental changes, the economic changes. I mean, we are entering a period of time where we should be expecting the world's economy to start to really fall apart for environmental reasons, where we're seeing like crazed right-wing governments taking over, and that is not the sort of thing that happens by coincidence. Uh, th this is going to be a very troubled time, and I think that's what really highlights the significance and the importance of um, our lack of systems of accountability. I mean, either are having them or are not having them. And as long as we keep maintaining systems of, like entire social systems, which perpetuate and accentuate and enable and reward that kind of thing, we are going to have trouble and this will just be yet another tool to amplify that trouble by a lot. So again, the algorithms are a symptom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think we should open it up. Right? I want to make sure we, we get through everyone. Hi. Um, the, uh, it seems like the uh, elephant in the room is, is the data, that uh, algorithms uh, make their decisions based on data, and all of us are rapidly increasing the amount of data we have. Uh, what are the ethics behind how you choose to gather the data and, most importantly, repurpose data? That There's a lot of times we gathered it for this, Oh, look, we can not only spell check, we can see the pace of the, is he happy or sad? Or lots of other things you can see. So what are the ethics around increasing gathering of data and repurposing of data? Yeah, that's a great question. We definitely need to be thinking about consent of the people that we gather data from. Um, and that includes them knowing knowing how their data is going to be used. I would say also not gathering more data than is needed and thinking about how that data can be misused later. Um, another kind of very concerning trend is just increasing surveillance and that uh, data you know, gathered for one purpose will be used for others. We've seen this recently with ICE accessing state uh, driver's license databases um, and kind of recognizing how surveillance throughout history has been used to try to um, squash movements for positive social change and that uh, yeah, any data gathered can be stolen or misused at a later point to be very uh, cautious and careful around that. Yeah. So we're gonna close the doors and have a whole new panel just on that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think there might be like a sort of a, a several parts to it too because you know, on the one hand, sort of in the very short term we have uh, and with the GDPR and its increasing copying around the world, I think this idea of uh, you know, consent with regards to, or sorry, informed consent with regards to a named purpose and concepts like this are going to become more widespread. And that's going to somewhat mitigate the direct issue raised. Um, but I think that in the longer term, um, we're going to see some very deep changes happening in our society around the value of data and the use of data. I know even at dinner earlier, you know, we were talking about uh, like, uh, the value of data, and I think about the data in terms of economic value and things like that. I actually have a suspicion that right now we're going through this weird swing where the value of data is temporarily high because there's suddenly a lot of it and there's a long history of data is valuable because it is scarce, because you know something that someone else doesn't. And now we're getting into like, some of the values of data that aren't tied to scarcity. But in the long term, I suspect we're going to see some kind of equilibrium and society coming to a different place and I don't know what that place is going to look like. You know, I, I always compare it to like the problem of villages versus cities. In villages where everybody knows everybody else's business and social norms built up around sort of the constructively not knowing things. Like we, we just think we know this, but we don't know this. Uh, whereas in cities, there's a concept of anonymity um, because the, the constructive not knowing doesn't scale when you have thousands and thousands of people. In city, like, the whole concept of anonymity only emerges when people live in cities. It was another way of dealing with the problem of information. Um, of literally, there are private facts that other people don't know about you. And now we're entering some kind of third situation where well, you have the, you know, the um, panopticon of a, of a small village, but you don't have the strong social norms currently that manage how it works in a village. We're gonna have to equilibrate somewhere. And I think in the long term, that's going to be the dominant effect for this. Just one other point I wanna say about that is uh, Zainab Tufekci, who's kind of like a foremost expert um, on socio-technical topics, has said, you know, data privacy is a public good and we need to think about it more as, you know, like clean air, or, uh, safe drinking water, and so that it's not something that can be governed by kind of all these individual decisions, which is how we're treating it now, which is, 
a big topic for discussion, but just to also think about that framing as this is a, a public good. And there's a third panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually like that corollary to that, which is many times, you know, you get the, uh, the algorithms basically end up accentuating the biases in the data. Is there any way of actually vetting the data to see that you can get uh, what biases are inherent there? I mean, there's, I mean, there, it really comes down to analytical tools, counterfactuals, things like that. And so depending on what the data is and what the set looks like um, and what sort of bias you're looking for and things like that, it's really, you have to go pick it apart and figure out um, how you can look at it and see. And there's also, when you're using your models and building your models, uh, doing the, you know, kind of counter examples and the extremes of, uh, and changing the data in different ways to see what happens to the model when you do that type of thing. So, I mean, it it's really comes down to testing uh, and testing and understanding what, what you have and being able to visualize it. And a technique, uh, so the gender shade study is something that got a lot of attention in the past year, um, but this is a, a researcher at MIT, Joy Balamwini, evaluated commercial computer vision products from IBM, Microsoft, uh, Face++, Plus Plus, and then Amazon in a follow-up study and looked at their error rates on light-skinned men, light-skinned women, dark-skinned men, and dark-skinned women, and found that they were, you know, the error rate was 40 times higher on dark-skinned women. Um, and this was something that Clearly, the companies had not tested before releasing these products um, and was kind of a, you know, in theory, it seems like this simple technique to look at these subgroups, but was very powerful. Yeah. Of course, that also shows up all of the ways in which this is hard. Uh, one of the reasons why facial recognition on dark skinned faces is hard is, hard is because of Shirley cards. Uh, decisions made about how, how color film should be calibrated, which was made in the 1910s. Um, so these are the standards used to determine like, what constitutes a good image. And they're called Shirley cards because it was a picture of a woman named Shirley, the original one. And until the 1970s, it was all white women. I think there were a few white men. And black and brown faces were added not because of racial inequality, but because of furniture manufacturers complained that they weren't getting good reproduction of pictures of wood. Um, and, but to this day, it means that the normalization of the output of CCD cameras, even to this, is still really bad, and so if you look at photos of dark-skinned people, unless you actually understand the, the different theatrical lighting you have to use and different kinds of things you need to highlight them, pictures of dark-skinned people turn out terribly. They look like globs. And that has to do with like, these very deep decisions made a long-ass time ago. Wait, somebody? Uh, I don't necessarily have a question, but more of just what I've just gathered from you guys being up there. Um, I, I teach a 300 student class over at Berkeley on topic of cognitive science, which is, oh. addresses topics like the nature of consciousness, uh, the structure of language, implicit biases, uh, which I think is a nice platform to have students really think about the technologies that they'll be going into. Many of the students go work at Google and Facebook and all these tech companies, but you know, what's the use of building these products if you're unable to question the social ethical implications to them? Um, and I took it upon myself to include an ethics piece to it. It wasn't required by the university. In fact, most of the um, majors there don't really have an ethics component. So what I do every semester is to have my 300 undergraduates watch Black Mirror. <laughs> Black Mirror as a homework assignment to use that as a conversational piece to talk about these social ethical implications because you know many of them will be going to tech. And I feel like it's a little bit disheartening that some of the things that we're talking about were becoming reactive rather than proactive. Uh, so as an educator, you know, I think Warren and Rachel, you talked about education and, and resources. Are, is there anything, like, anything more that I can do and other instructors and educators can do to really train the new generations of tech practitioners, ethicists, you know, all of that, um, so that they, they, they're the ones who can also make an impact? Because you know, if you look around this room, you know, the demographic is, you know, don't you wish, I kind of wish that there should be more young people here who will eventually be working in the areas that you guys will eventually be working in. Um, so my question is, like, is there anything more that we can do to really educate the next generation of, you know, tech practitioners and ethicists to really make a difference? Um, so that's it. Um, one resource I can flag for you that uh, I worked on in my previous role before I joined Salesforce is we, um, we worked with Mozilla and, and a handful of others, Craig Newmark, 
um, to fund a community of practice uh, of educators integrating, especially in computer science, but integrating ethics directly, not as like a side module, but like into core curriculum. And so there's a, if you look at, if you look at the Mozilla website, there's a whole set of open source Mm -hmm. um, resources that they're creating that can be helpful, and I think more importantly, this community that is forming around that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, two, two things I might uh, add to this one. Um, one of them, uh, in fact, it's one of the people who was awarded one of these grants, and I, I'm so embarrassed, I can't remember her name. She's a professor at the University of Colorado. Casey Fiesler. Casey Fiesler, <laughs> yes. Um, she has this, in fact, if you search for her uh, paper on the Black Mirror Method, she's actually been, uh, the Black Mirror Writer's Room, I think it's called, is the name of the exercise she puts her students through. It is one of the best designed exercises for teaching people ethical thinking I've ever seen, and it's based on similar things. Yeah, she, she frames it as uh, speculation is this skill that uh, kind of we need to learn and practice. And so yeah, she has uh, students create a, a Black Mirror epi episode. Yeah, and the, the other thing I'd uh, point out, uh, so I started out as a physicist. Um, there are no ethics classes in a physics curriculum, but ethics is a nonstop subject of discussion. And I think that's the, it, it's the after effect of the field uh, after, uh, after Hiroshima. And I know that uh, chemists have very similar things. Uh, for them, it was chemical weapons and before that, dynamite. Um, when it gets wired into a field, it's not even that it's like part of the syllabus sometimes. It's that that's what you're talking about at lunch and at dinner like every day is like, would you do this? Would you do that? How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. So building up that conversation even beyond the classroom, I think, has a really big impact. Yeah, and just uh, two more resources I would mention. Um, Casey Fiesler has also put together a crowdsourced spreadsheet of over 200 mm. tech ethics courses with links to their syllabi, which is almost like too much, um, <laughs> but it's, it's really neat. And I know she's kind of doing some meta-analysis on their contents now. And then I wanted to make a shout out to Chris Wiggins, who's a professor at Columbia University and also the chief data scientist of the New York Times. But he has a course that he co-teaches with a history professor on the past, present, and future of data. And the, um, everything's available on GitHub for this. And it goes through uh, kind of all these uh, historical developments. Um, I didn't know this regression was first introduced to do race science um, and these really kind of uh, horrible applications. And you know, it covers the Tuskegee uh, syphilis trial and just kind of all these um, ethical failures, really, um, in, in statistics and science up through the present day. And I think that's a really interesting framing as well. Question. Yes, hi, my name is Thierry Doyen from Cloud4Y. I just wanted to throw something, maybe artificial intelligence was a cool name, but maybe something like knowledge machine would be less scary for the public. But uh, what I wanted to ask is, it's great to hear all we're talking about because here we're, you know, we're really conscientious about what we do, but I'm really afraid of AI in rogue nations, in rogue people, rogue organizations, and what are your thoughts on that? And is there a way that we can prevent it ending in the wrong hands and really causing damage? Because it has the power. <laughs> yes, on <and> that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, really cynical part of me says, look at the non-rogue nations who have it. I'm kind of worried about them, too. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I, I, oh, sorry. Oh. We're just pointing out he's been waiting for, for a bit. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I wanted to ask about, um, apropos of what you were saying, um, about the free, the importance of the free and open exchange of ideas and ideas that aren't necessarily owned, like ideas in physics or in fundamental research. Somehow, with this uh, problem with secrecy and ownership of information, in universities, they're already are problems with people talking about AI at conferences under, I mean, people, ha some faculty I know have to take precautions and use the university's laptop instead of their own laptop. And there's this whole culture that's kind of against the free and open exchange of ideas around AI and sharing mm -hmm. it. So I wanted to ask if there's anything going on to counter that in academia and in research? I would say, I mean, on the whole, I have found the AI community to be 
relatively open, and particularly, I mean, this has shifted even uh, in the last few years. Uh, Jeremy and I were talking earlier about uh, when we started Fast AI, feeling like people weren't sharing a lot of the practical info, but now there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, and that, in general, I feel like the machine learning community is responding to, you know, open sourcing more code and uh, kind of, yeah, like sharing more of what they're doing. And I mean, Archive, this place where people freely share papers is very, very heavily used. Um, so I think there are a lot of uh, positive trends there. Oh, physicist. Okay. Oh, the, the question was about physicist or chemist being legally prohibited. Uh, hmm. You know, I think I think that in a lot of these cases, the most. I mean, academia is pretty far behind in a lot of the space. I think like most of the most interesting stuff is happening in industry nowadays, and it's much more acute a situation there. And actually, I think one of the biggest problems we've had in a place where actually something like the Churchill Club can make a really big difference, um, there's a really big need for practitioners in fields like uh, respectful computing, right? people who work in privacy, abuse, security, all of these things, to be able to talk, share notes, compare things, and they need really strong conditions of secrecy in order to be able to do so because everything you say will show up in the newspaper and in court filings and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there really is a very big need for more fora in which very, so it won't be open public discussion. It can't be under these circumstances, but at least more discussion so that you can form a community of practitioners. I will share another area where I think uh, there's uh, difficulties is for researchers who are looking at um, often kind of harmful impact of major tech companies have trouble accessing the data. And I saw a tweet the other day about how it's easier for marketers to buy this data than for um, academic researchers that are trying to hold companies accountable to access it. And I know the Knight Foundation has a petition out that a number of top researchers have signed, um, but that is kind of an issue of uh, you know allowing for responsible research, but also research that could uh, help hold hold tech companies accountable. Yes. Half an hour later, <laughs> right? Yeah, here we are. Here we are. But it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I'm patient. So my name is Jason Ma. I I uh, want to ask you this very uh, probably we all play in a global village, correct? So you guys are ethical companies, and I commend you for that. And I do believe that you do implement ethics and integrity in what you do as leaders in your field. But you know that looking at the world out there, China, Russia, et cetera, and a lot of nations are being very aggressive in investing and promoting and going for AI, machine learning, et cetera. Now, when it comes to ethics and integrity, you know that certain nations out there and certain players out there, they may not have our integrity level or ethics level, right? And they're being very aggressive in, in, in advancing their AI and machine learning initiatives. So I would love to hear perspective or strategies or mindset from each one of you on how you and your company and, your, and how are you influencing your ecosystem? to try to not lose advantage while doing well by doing good. Does that make sense to you? So uh, maybe I'll stick to one part of the question, which is to say I, I, I think the reason why we take this so seriously is we believe not only will it help us avert risk in the future, but that it will actually add value to the company, right? And so we know that if we're at a panel, we're all sitting around talking about how, essentially, how do you govern and manage algorithms? Our customers are thinking about that too, and they want our help, right? And so if we pay attention to that question, both for how we manage ourselves and how we like offer features to them, it's actually gonna accrue to our bottom line. Right? So I think sometimes there's this framing of like, well, either you're ethical or you're profitable, choose. And I, I feel like that, that framing, which is I, not, not exactly, not really what you said, but like I, I, I hear it a lot. And I, th I think it's unhelpful because I think there's like in this moment of turbulence, ethical leadership is what's gonna have your stock continue to go up as opposed to take constant hits because of crises in the newspapers. 
I, th I think it's sort of in the context of my work, we have an even more amplified version of this because we know that, uh, so you know, we, uh, we are working on making work better, so we actually work with companies to help improve their culture and their environment and their working environment. And all of these things that Paula said are true for our customers as well as for us. So if we can help them achieve that, then that actually directly creates value for them. Um, so that's, I think, our way of trying to influence our ecosystem and the world around us. And basically why we founded the company is because we wanted to do that. Um, although I don't think that necessarily speaks to the earlier part of your question when you start talking about uh, you know, China, Russia, et cetera. And of course, we had the earlier question about that. That's, um, that's a very different question, and it goes to deeper issues where you have fundamentally incompatible goals, not just incompatible means. Um, and of course, you know, we can talk about Chinese history and exactly why, why she views artificial intelligence and, uh, so, and the use of social control in certain ways, and what are the trade-offs that are on his mind and on the minds of the Politburo. Um, I can understand where they are coming from, even if I do not necessarily think that they are right and think they're going to achieve something very horrible in the process. Um, I don't have a magic tool for fixing that. Yeah, two things I would say about this. One, I do want to highlight that I have a lot of concerns within the US as well, and you know, technologies like Amazon's Ring Doorbell, which is partnered with over 400 police departments. This is a kind of smart camera doorbell, um, but has this very kind of murky private-public partnership that's being sub subsidized by taxpayer money, uh, and uh, some uh, police officers involved have said that they can get the data from Amazon without a warrant of there's a lot of kind of question of like what exactly is going on here and those sorts of trends worry me uh, within the US. Um, but I would agree that there is uh, kind of when you talk about the issues with uh, Russia or China or other nations um, that that I think particularly in areas like disinformation is a huge issue. And Rene DeResta, who's kind of a top, uh, top expert on computational propaganda has said that we need to think of disinformation not as about determining true or false, but about it's a cybersecurity issue and looking at manipulative and bad actors, um, and that that has had an impact. Um, you know, research has linked uh, Russia to anti-vaxxing propaganda, which has had, you know, a concrete effect in the, the U.S. and Europe. And so it is, yeah, like a very, uh, very real issue. I think we have time for one more. Oh, uh, yeah, hi, Weber from Ness. Uh, my question is, do you think the way the corporate America is structured today, we are ready to operationalize ethics in AI? Who do you think is the ideal title to kind of champion this kind of initiative as a chief digital officer, chief innovation officer, chief HR, or it has to come from the CEO? I think there's someone who has a title right here. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, I'm there too. <laughs> That's right. Okay. But that said, I, I would say that the ideal title is actually uh, engineer and product manager and yeah. shelf stalker. And I mean, this, this, if you have a single sales person, person, salesperson very much, yes. if you have a single person who's responsible for this, you're already in trouble. I mean, the CEO is, is responsible for it because the CEO is responsible for all of the culture at the company. But it's a culture, it's a culture of ethics, right? It's yeah. not a single person. A single person's not going to be able to do it. You have to have the buy-in from the organization, and everybody's got to have, you know, uh, some part in playing in in how the ethically run businesses. I don't think that's new. I think it's just we're seeing more concern about it now. Anyone else on this one? Okay. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives so candidly. We really appreciate it very much. We have a small token of our appreciation for you, and it is, of course, the Churchill Club speaker t-shirt. <laughs> oh. you. you wear that in very good health. Our next program coming up is the Thank 12th you. of September, the Churchill's event, as we look at fine examples from our community of collaboration, leadership, innovation, um, and societal good, work for societal good. We have John W. Thompson coming, uh, people from Zoom, Slack, and um, Peloton, as well as Carl Gordino from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And then on the 16th of September, Brad Smith is coming down, the president of Microsoft, to talk about his perspectives about 
uh, how companies sh need to be responsible for the uh, collateral effects of technologies that they are developing. So hope you'll join us for those. We have actually lots more before the end of the year, so please keep an eye on us. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. See you next time. Good night. <laughs>